Let's talk about the origins of Pride mm -hmm. Month, celebrated in June. How did that come about? I mean, it goes back to what, 69? Right, this is the 52nd anniversary now of the Stonewall Riots in New York City at the Stonewall Inn Bar, uh, which was an LGBTQ friendly space where you know police regularly would raid LGBTQ affirming and friendly spaces, not just in New York City, but all across the nation. Here in Louisville, I mean, raids were happening up until well into the 80s and maybe even beyond. Um, but it, at that time in New York, uh, you could be arrested for lots of different um, absurd uh, charges, including uh, wearing too many garments, articles of clothing of the opposite gender, something like that. And, Police would find any reason to arrest LGBTQ folks, but especially trans folks, black, queer individuals. And at one raid in 1969, folks had had enough. And it was largely black and Latinx, queer community members, black trans folks, who picked up and threw the first bricks and bottles at New York City police officers. And it sparked three nights of rioting, you know, which is why I remind people you know, as we talk about pride and the Black Lives Matter movement, they're intimately connected. We would have never had any of the progress on LGBTQ rights if it hadn't been for queer and trans folks of color rising up against an unjust police force in New York City at that time. You know, it didn't make a huge amount of news. It started sort of bubbling up in the paper after uh, the first night and then the second night, but it really was one of the seminal moments in LGBTQ civil rights history. So then like a year later, then I think there was a celebration to mark that anniversary and then it kind of took off globally yeah. where June became the month where yeah. Pride is celebrated. And that's because of course June 28, uh, 29 and 30 were the Knights of the Riot. I the believe. Knights of the Riot. Yeah. And what does Pride stand for, just in case mm -hmm. people don't know that? Yeah. You know, it's really a celebration of being our authentic selves, living openly and freely as LGBTQ folks and being celebrated, celebrating our own identities and celebrating our broad and diverse community. And the reason that we do it um, is so that we have visibility, so that we have community. You know, when I was coming out in the late 90s and certainly before that, Pride was one of the only places where you could go where you knew that you could connect with other LGBTQ folks in a safe environment where everyone was going to be affirming and everyone else was going to either share your identity or be an ally that would support uh, your LGBTQ plus identity. Now it has grown into, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of talk back and forth about sort of the commodification of pride and the corporatization of pride. Uh, and it's a double-edged sword because, you know, in some ways it does get away from the revolutionary roots, from the protest roots of what being queer mm -hmm. was, that it was a protest just to live your life openly and proud. And now we have the Walmarts and the Targets and all of the companies that are uh, in the pride parades and at the pride festivals. Um, and in a large way, you know, I think of it as a gay teenager, what that would have meant to me to walk into a target. To see that representation see at that display, level. See a pride display. So, you know, there's a balance for all of this. But, um, you know, pride has largely become and is a community celebration where everyone can be who they are and be supported and accepted now. Because you brought that up two times. I just wanted to, you're the executive mm -hmm. director of the Fairness Campaign. I want to talk about your journey sure. to get to that. But your journey of coming out, as you said, mm -hmm. that, that there wasn't that kind of representation. What was your personal journey in, in coming out? Yeah, the year that I came out, um, the biggest LGBTQ icon there was, was Ellen. It was the same year Ellen had come out, I believe, 1997. Um, and I came out at uh, St. X as a junior, um, which uh, surprises some people, but really I had a relatively easy or privileged experience, I, I believe. There were already a number of St. X students that were out of the closet in the late 90s. A lot of my friends were already openly gay. By the time I came out, it wasn't news anymore, in a way. Um, and I, I found a very supportive environment through some of the faculty, the administration there. Now, since then, things have, have changed dramatically, and I have not heard the same experiences, aside from the very current, very serious problems uh, that St. X is facing right now. I have not heard the same affirming experience from people that came after me at St. X that sort of my class of 98 uh, had. Um, but it was still difficult because, it, you know, it, there weren't queer icons. There weren't queer role model, models by and large. And then I went to Bellarmine University or Bellarmine College first and then it changed to university while I was there where there were really no openly LGBTQ teachers, faculty, administration. 
uh, and very few openly LGBTQ people on campus. To be honest, it felt a little bit uh, like a regression when I, when I went to Bellarmine at the time. Now that has changed dramatically. Bellarmine's very open, very accepting. Now I just spoke at their Lavender graduation, uh, their fifth annual LGBTQ graduation celebration. But navigating, like oh, you said, and you said your experience compared to others was probably, as you, you used Better, the word yeah. privilege. I mean, yeah, being white and male. I mean, there are all sorts of things that made it easier. Well, what advice would you give to somebody who's navigating that mm -hmm. right now? To, to find your community, um, and the community is, is so big and so broad, and if it is reaching out to the Fairness Campaign, getting connected to the Louisville Youth Group, Louisville Pride Foundation, Queer Kentucky, Kentucky Anna Pride Foundation, there's so many different organizations, but then also just organic communities and LGBTQ friendly businesses that, um, you know, I would hope that people can feel like they can be who they truly are now, but the struggles are definitely not over, and that's why so many people still fear coming out, um, still fear sharing their identity. When we see the anti-LGBTQ attacks all over the nation, but here in Kentucky, I mean, we had um, seven anti-LGBTQ bills that we fought in the Kentucky General Assembly this year, most of them targeting our trans community, and particularly transgender youth. This is our most vulnerable community right now, the community that needs the most support because it is the one that is under attack all across the United States. And just in Tennessee, I mean, they passed four or five anti-LGBT bills alone this year. Uh, West Virginia passed the anti-transgender athletic ban. Um, and uh, Arkansas and others have passed uh, anti-trans uh, um, health care to prevent children who are trans from accessing gender-affirming care. Um, I think the Arkansas governor might have vetoed one of those bills. But, but it's why you stay it's vigilant. Yeah, it's why you stay vigilant. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, executive director of the Fairness Campaign. You're its first director, right? Right. How many years now? I've been there for 12 and a half years. Of course, Fairness is celebrating this year its 30th anniversary. 1991 was when 10 Louisvillians came together and formed what they called the Fairness Campaign. Yeah. And it came about how and yeah. why? You said 10 people. Right, uh, and there were many more involved at the time. Um, and of course, I can't tell the story nearly as well as someone who was in the room, uh, Eric Graniger, Jeff Rogers, uh, Carla Wallace, uh, so many folks, Pam McMichael, uh, Lisa Gunterman, I could name all of them. Um, but they came together um, first, many of them, through fighting for racial justice. Uh, many of the early fairness campaign leaders were tied in closely with Ann and Carl Braden mm -hmm. and had fought on many uh, civil rights battles here in Louisville. Uh, and, you know, that's why the fairness campaign, when they founded it to pursue, at first, that fairness ordinance. You know, Louisville was the first city in the state to offer some discrimination protections for LGBTQ people. And that was the goal in 91, but it was infused with an understanding that we had to dismantle systemic racial justice and fight in an anti-racist way through all of our work to both build a broad coalition that would ultimately get us to our goal, but second, that um, we recognize the inherent interconnectedness, or they did, of all of the forms of oppression. That's what we talked about, that overlap yeah. again. You know, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, um, prejudice against the disabled community, all of these things are, are l intimately looped in together. And if you start dismantling any one of them, you, you benefit everyone. And the LGBTQ community, as we know, is part of literally every community. So our intersections um, abound. We, we are incredibly broad and diverse, just like the, the world's community. <laughs> and let's talk about, you said Louisville was the first in with the anti-discrimination mm -hmm. policy with the Fairness Ordinance. What does that do specifically? Right, so when Louisville, uh, the city proper, first in 1999 passed the Fairness Ordinance, it originally banned LGBTQ discrimination in employment. So you couldn't be fired from your job based on your sexual orientation or gender identity. Shortly thereafter, Lexington became the first city in the state to expand that to include housing and public accommodations. So when I say public accommodations, I mean places of business, museums, bus rides, parks, uh, restaurant, all of those places were then covered, said that you couldn't be kicked out of a restaurant or kicked out of your housing if someone thought you were LGBTQ. Uh, Louisville, uh, Jefferson County then did that later that year, so that encompassed the entire county and then Louisville 
had to pass it again once we became right. Metro in 2004. But since that time, uh, you know, we've got 21 communities now across the Commonwealth that have banned LGBTQ discrimination in those three areas, employment, housing, and public accommodations. And I go back to the one that made national news, which was VICO <laughs> yes. in Eastern Kentucky. Right. I think I read that, I mean, it had fewer than 350 residents yeah. in that town in far Eastern Kentucky. Yeah. So when they passed it, did someone reach out to you or how did that come to be? And then I want to talk about yeah. the lessons in that small town. That, that, that's a good question. Um, so I think that our opponents sometimes think that we sort of show up in a city and say, ah, oh, we're here and we're going to make this uh, LGBT, you know, territory. Um, the fairness campaign has always worked from a model that we want to organize in communities that, that want to organize and that reach out to us. Um, and we really strive to, uh, to form authentic connections in the communities where we're working and follow the lead of people who live in the places where I don't live uh, because they know what's best. So we've been working for quite a time in Berea and had built a huge grassroots movement in Berea um, where uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of the residents there had been working for an LGBTQ fairness ordinance. That movement went on for four or five years. We ultimately lost the vote there. Um, but one of our leaders there, um, her brother uh, was a city commissioner in the town of Vico, where they were both from. Uh, they're both LGBTQ. Uh, and um, so he was an openly gay city commissioner in Vico. And I just sort of followed him online for a little bit. And several months later, he was appointed mayor after the mayor stepped down. I said, oh my gosh, there's an openly gay mayor in this uh, Appalachian coal town of 300 folks. I wonder if he'd be open to talking about a fairness ordinance because we hadn't had a victory uh, since I'd been hired. Uh, Louisville, Lexington, and Covington all did fairness around the same time, early 90s, early two, or late 90s, early 2000s. And then we didn't have another city for 10 years. I reached out to Mayor Cummings, Johnny Cummings on Facebook. I said, hey, would you be open to it? Uh, he called, he said, sure. Uh, the ACLU and, and I drove down, uh, Michael Aldrich at the ACLU and our Eastern Kentucky organizer at the time, and it was just a, an easy, frank conversation with the city commission where they had already accepted LGBTQ people in their community. Clearly, they had an openly gay mayor um, who was also the town hairdresser, which the Colbert Report liked to highlight as a, you know, got to get that stereotype in there. Um, but it was just a great story of how a community in rural America where it wasn't seen, you know, the LGBTQ rights movement had been seen largely as a big city issue, as right. a big city movement. And we said, look, we know that there are queer folks living all across America and all across Kentucky. And so when, when the city commission voted on it, it was a three to one vote. The mayor didn't even have to cast a vote because you know the mayor alone. Right, I mean, it was unanimous. Tie. So we had, um, you know, an easy vote there. And what we didn't realize at the time is that they were the smallest city in all of America at the time that had passed that, a fairness ordinance. So I'm sorry, the vote was three to one? It was three to three one, to one. So, okay. yeah, not unanimous, yeah. but the mayor didn't have to cast a vote uh, because you, know, still you got the majority, three out of four commissioners there. Uh, and so that's when uh, the New York Times and Stephen Colbert and everyone really picked up the story and lifted it up. And honestly, it started, it was a spark that changed um, a national narrative around uh, LGBTQ rights in rural areas. And that was my question to you. What was the lesson in that to you and to the nation, do you think? And I think yeah. you were just starting yeah, it affirmed that. what we were already seeing in Berea and Richmond um, and many of the other cities that we had started working in. We knew that there was huge support and acceptance among most communities for their LGBTQ neighbors, family members, siblings. Um, what we found was that in uh, local politics or local government, often that was where resistance lied. Um, and so, you know, how do we amass the, you know, the population of support that we knew was there? Um, and so Vico was just a shining example of what, what we were seeing everywhere, was that here's a community where it's just not a big deal to be gay. They've got other problems to worry about. You know, uh, Appalachia has a lot more problems to worry about. And the attitude was very much, you know, this is just about protecting our black neighbors as well, just like we protect our, you know, uh, neighbors of uh, different religions and who come from different countries and who are immigrants. This just seems like the right thing to do. Um, and so it was just such an easy conversation and um, 
Yeah, it's definitely sparked a string of victories here in Kentucky. Frankfurt was quickly next to pass fairness, and then Kim Davis's hometown of Moorhead, uh, the famous was, Rowan County yes. clerk who refused marriage licenses. Several years before she became a national commodity, we passed fairness unanimously in her hometown of Moorhead. And all of that was because of Vico and the example that it set. And other cities saying, gosh, if Vico of 334 residents can do it and have an openly gay mayor, of course we can do it. Um, and so now, you know, 21 communities across the state, we've got about 30% of the Commonwealth's population covered by a discrimination fairness law now. Is there any hope of a statewide? Yes, maybe. Yes, maybe? Okay. Uh, you know, that's, that's still in the works, right? That's been the overarching right? goal. You know, the reason we go city by city and county by county is to have the conversation where state legislators live so that they will take it to Frankfurt. Um, and that has been very effective. When I started, there were maybe a total of 10 co-sponsors on the statewide fairness laws. You know, now nearly a third of the entire Kentucky General Assembly signs on to, as a co-sponsor, LGBTQ legislation, including many Republicans. You know, this is a bipartisan issue. Now. I was going to say, because there are bi yeah. there's bipartisan uh, support for, like, even the convert ban on yeah, conversion the ban therapy. Ban on conversion therapy has really skyrocketed, um, and largely thanks to Senator Alice Forgy Kerr, a Republican from Lexington, who uh, was the lead sponsor on the conversion therapy ban this year. Um, and there was a personal connection with her, correct? Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Senator Kerr uh, has, has spoken openly about her openly gay son. Uh, and so, yeah, she obviously saw, saw the connections. Um, and other uh, Republican leaders like Julie Rocky Adams um, in the House, uh, Representative Jason Nemus has signed on, Representative Kim Banta um, from Northern Kentucky is one of the lead co-sponsors on one of the statewide fairness laws. So we've seen a, a huge boost in bipartisan support, but there hasn't necessarily been the political will to get one of the positive issues across the finish line. What we've been able to do, though, is stop all of the anti-LGBTQ legislation from moving forward in Kentucky. I've already mentioned we had seven But that would be considered year. a victory. This is a, a different huge kind of, victory. Right. Yes, every, yes. It's actually how we measure victory right now, and I, I don't know that we can hold this balance forever. Um, even our friends uh, in the conservative supermajorities um, may not be able to prevent some of the attacks that are sure to come. Um, the Sunrise uh, Baptist Children's Home issue uh, that's going on right now where uh, Governor Bashir's office um, has offered a universal contract to all of the state contractors that includes sexual orientation and gender identity among protected classes uh, from discrimination. Sunrise Baptist Children's Home won't sign the contract because of that provision. In the past, that provision has not been included. Is that right. correct? Yeah, that's correct. That um, I, I do not believe previously in state contractors, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity was, was a required But protection. Governor Bashir, Andy Bashir said, we are going to put it in this. And right. that, that came back, and this controversy is brewing because he said language for federal contracts. Mm -hmm. Is that... Yeah, it, it's very consistent with language for federal contracts, too. So, you know, any agency that's going to be contract, contracting federally right now is going to have to also have LGBTQ discrimination protections uh, in their agency. And so this is just an acknowledgement that state taxpayer dollars should not be going to agencies, should not be funding agencies that will discriminate against any Kentuckian. You're saying, though, I think we had a conversation before mm -hmm. we started recording, though, that if they want to do that, on yeah. their own, that's right. fine yeah. with protection with mm -hmm. the First Amendment, free with religion, right. yeah. but with the state dollars is where you take exception. Right. And that's where the, the governor's administration is coming down as well, and the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, to say that this is uh, public taxpayer money, uh, and we wouldn't give that to any agency that discriminates against anyone. You wouldn't want to go into an agency that discriminates against women or uh, black folks or uh, immigrants or people of other religions. And so that's just an acknowledgement that taxpayer dollars um, should, should be open to everyone and that you know, no one should be discriminated against. Three quick points I mm -hmm. wanted to, to finish up with. You know, I have seen you at uh, some of the protests downtown. Yeah. And again, that interconnectedness that you talked about is because if, if one is discriminated against, mm -hmm. we're all vulnerable. Right. And, and you know, the, the LGBTQ plus community has a lot of work to do when it comes to racial justice. I think particularly the white gay community um, has not been 
proactively anti-racist. And this is what we've got to remember too, is that um, marginalized communities can still perpetuate discrimination and prejudice against other marginalized communities. And I think that's a reckoning that the queer community and, and much of white America is having right now. Have I been anti-racist? Not just have I not been racist, have I been working to fight racism and discrimination? And by doing that, we lift everyone. You know, a, a community that stops police violence against black Americans and brown Americans and immigrants um, is one that everyone feels safer in. Um, and LGBTQ folks, and particularly LGBTQ black communities, communities of color, experience disproportionate violence, disproportionate discrimination, disproportionate job discrimination, you know, all across the board. And so we've got to do everything that we can uh, to fight for racial justice in the country. It benefits the queer community, but it benefits everyone. And I was just wondering, what gives you the strength to keep going? I mean, because every day, it, I mean, <laughs> no, you have to ponder that every now. I mean, every day could be considered a slugfest, right? Sure. I mean. But it's exciting. Uh, and that's but what, what is out. it, though, your inner, that every day you get up and get out there and this fight right. is at top of mind I for mean, you? I it's got to be. Uh, you know, if I, if I had not been gay, um, you know, would my eyes have been open to the injustices of the world growing up as, as a white um, man in America? I don't, I don't know. Um, what drives me is that I've seen the injustices against my community. It opened my eyes to the injustices uh, against so many other communities. You know, I have become more fiercely anti-racist in this work because I've listened to black people tell their stories. I've listened to immigrants tell their stories and um, that's not my America. Um, and I can't rest until the America that I want to live in is the one where everyone has opportunity, where everyone is being treated fairly and where equity is reached, not just equality, because there is disproportionate disadvantage that has been created through generations in America. Um, and we've got we've to rectify that. We've got to, do something to create stronger equity in the country. And in, until it's done, I, I'm not done. And I know that it won't be done in my lifetime. So I hope that I have this energy and this passion to keep doing this throughout my life until we see um, a more fair and equitable America because, it, you know, it, no one should be treated the way that marginalized communities get treated in this country. And if folks don't believe it's happening, you just have to listen. I was going to say, is there one final thought you would say to galvanize somebody who might listen to this for them to get out and do their due diligence in these causes as well? If the events of the past year haven't animated you yet, um, I'm a little uncertain what might, but if me asking you to go back and look at it all again, if you're not convinced yet, to, you know, to read the 1619 Project, to read works from black authors and queer authors and especially black queer authors and folks who are telling you um, in, in graphic and often horrifying detail the injustices that they have suffered repeatedly. If that doesn't animate you, then at least get out of the way um, and let us do our work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.